Amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 33, we're co uh, closing in real close here to the end. This will actually be the last midweek service for the book of Deuteronomy. I'm going to finish up uh, the last chapter on Sunday night, so hopefully you don't use that as an excuse to stay away. You say, oh, I already know what he's preaching, more of that Deuteronomy stuff. I'm just going to slit this one out. Uh, it's been a great book. Uh, I've already got our, my next book picked out. I'm really excited to preach that, but I'm not giving it away. If you want to know what it is, you're going to have to show up next Thursday. So, uh, I mean, I guess maybe unless you really grease my palm well enough. I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. I shouldn't joke like that, but um, that, is, that is the case. But uh, anyway, Deuteronomy chapter 33, uh, this is a great passage, of course. Um, Moses' last words, you know, these are really significant. And he's here, you know, giving out a blessing. And if we want to just jump right into it, we'll look in it. Verse 1, it says, And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. He sa and he said, The Lord uh, came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. Uh, from his right hand went a fiery law for them. And I love how it describes uh, the law that he gave as fiery. You know, it wasn't this smooth, comfortable law that was just going to, you know, make them feel good. It was a fiery law. You know, it, it burned. It had some heat. It had some power. Um, that's the, you know, that is the word of God. Uh, but that's not a point I'm really going to develop here. He goes on to verse 3. He says, Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thine hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Everyone shall receive of thy words. Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob, and he was king in Jeshurun when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. So it says there in verse 5 that when they were coming together and receiving the word, that, you know, the heads of the people of the, tri of the tribes of Israel, meaning the, the people that were considered the rulers, you know, the 70 that were appointed, when they came together that he was king in Jeshurun. Now what does it mean that he was king? Now obviously we know it doesn't mean king in the sense that, you know, they put a crown upon his head and a scepter in his hand and that he ruled as a king in the sense that we would think of it. But he ruled as a king in the sense that he was the one in charge. You know, he was the ruler at that time. You have to remember during Moses' time, you know, they'd come out of Egypt, but it was before the system of the judges had been instituted, which is what they were going to go into once they got over into uh, the promised land. That They would be under God's system of rule, which would have been the judges. But prior to that, you know, they hadn't really established you know, a governance, a way of, of governing themselves. And Moses, you know, it, it during that time, temporarily filled in as, you know, a type of king, as it calls him here, a king in Jeshurun. Doesn't mean that he was, you know, of some, uh, you know, um, you know um, um, monarchical, if that's even a word. He wasn't a monarch, you know, of some, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, of some lineage, you know. Uh, but it, in the sense that he, stu he stood as a king would, you know, as somebody who was an authority, as somebody who was in charge during that time. And what that should really, and I kind of want to focus in on this part because that's interesting that it refers to him as a king. You know, and that's something that as we're seeing Moses pass off the scene here, you know, to, to remind ourselves of who Moses was and what Moses, what was Moses? You know, he was a ruler. You know, and he was somebody that was in charge. You know, he was somebody that had authority. And what that should show us is that what we could learn from Deuteronomy, one of the many things we could learn is that you know, somebody has to be in charge in order for things to run smoothly, in order for God's work uh, to go forward, in order for his uh, will to be accomplished, somebody's got to be in charge. You know, had they just left it up to the people of Israel, if they had said, okay, Egypt or uh, Israel, go ahead, you decide what you want to do here. Very early on, they would have, they would have turned back to Egypt. I mean, how many times do we see him as we were reading through the book of Deuteronomy you know, longing for the leeks and the onions and the cucumbers of Egypt. How many times they talked about turning back and stoning Moses and had gotten disgruntled and been out of shape. You know, if the people had been in charge, they would have turned back. You know, and they probably wouldn't have made it. God probably would have just destroyed them at that point. But what that shows us is that somebody has to be in charge when there's a body there. When there's a group of people that have a goal that God wants to accomplish, somebody has to step up. Somebody has to be the leader. And you know, even, to, you know, and people have a problem with that. You know, that's something that's not really a popular message a lot of times, but that's just the fact of the matter. I mean, think about that in any other, you know, situation. You know, every company has leaders. They have supervisors and managers and, you know, district managers and, and CEOs and so on and so forth. There's people that make decisions who have authority over other people. 
You know, that's the way it goes in the world, the business world. You know, we could think about in, in many other settings, you know, in schools and institutions of learning. I mean, there's people that, you know, if they're going to get something done, someone's got to be the one that draws the line in the sand and says, this is the way it's going to be. And you know, that, that's the same way it is in the church, too, today, in the local church. You know, the local church has to have somebody in charge to say, this is the way it's going to be here. And, of course, that person has to, you know, rule based upon this book. You know, they're not free to just make up whatever they want. They're not free to do, as the Pharisees did, teach for, doctor, uh, teach for, for commandments, you know, the traditions of men. They have to, of course, be in line. This is the ultimate authority. We all understand that. But somebody has to stand up and say, well, here's the authority. Let's go to it, and we're going to make our decision based on what it says. Somebody's got to be in charge. Somebody's got to lead. Somebody's got to rule. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, things go to pot really quick. And uh, a lot of people, they don't like that today. You know, a lot of people want to sit out of church. They don't like the, they, you know, they don't, they, like, they don't like the idea of somebody having authority over them. Now, obviously, within the church, that authority only extends so far. It only extends as far as, you know, the church is concerned. You know, the church leadership can't come over to your house and, you know, inspect you <laughs> and say, hey, we're going to take a quick walk. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's not like that. Obviously, there's a limit. Okay, but as far as what takes place in the church house, how things are going to be, how are things are going to be run, what's going to be allowed, what's not going to be allowed, somebody's got to stand up and, and, you know, be the leader. And, of course, that's, that's the, the elder or the pastor, you know, or the bishop is what the Bible uses these terms interchangeably. And if you would, go over to Hebrews chapter 13, because I do want to talk about this for a minute, because this is something I think that we need to be reminded of. <coughs> that there is an authority in the local church. You know, and there's a way we should treat authority in the local church. There's a way we should conduct ourselves toward it. Uh, you know, specifically, you know, how, uh, we'll get in here, well, we'll get in here in a minute, but let's just look at Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews chapter 13, it says in verse 7, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. So who does that sound like? Somebody who's speaking to you the word of God. It's, you know, it sounds like a pastor. It sounds like a bishop. It sounds like an elder. You know, somebody who's speaking to the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, says, remember them. Jump down to verse 17. He says, obey them that have the rule over you. <clears throat> and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. Now, who's the, type, who's the person in your life that's going to be watching for your soul? Who's going to be caring about your spiritual needs? That's going to be your pastor. That's going to be your church leadership. That's, what, that's the role that they're going to fulfill. And the Bible's saying here that you ought to remember them and you ought to obey them. And he says, For they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So, you know, you can't really read this passage without pointing that out every time you read it. Is that, you know, he's saying obey them that have the rule over you. But notice there at the end, he says the, re the reason why you need to obey is so that they can give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that it's unprofitable for you, right? We get this idea that, you know, if we just buck against the church and we rebel and we, you know, we tell the pastor off and, you know, and we're just, we're going to, you know, we're not going to obey, we're not going to submit, we're not going to let them rule over us, that somehow, you know, we're going to come out on top, and they're the ones that are going to suffer. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if we develop that kind of an attitude, we're the ones that are going to suffer. You know, we're the ones that are not going to profit. You know, the church will continue. The church will go on, the pastor will be just fine. You know, he, he'll still, you know, his, because his spirituality doesn't depend on your, depend upon, you know, our obedience. You know, he has his own walk with God that, that he's accountable for. But if we buck against the church, if we, you know, scoff at what's being taught us from the word of God, you know, we're the ones that are going to suffer, not the church. <clears throat> you know, and, we, and that's, that's, that is the truth. I mean, I could, we could sit, I could get up here and tell you, uh, you know, we might even know people. You know, you don't have to be in church real long to know people that just get out of church, get backslidden. They, they, don't, they don't care about the things of God. I mean, do, does that do them any good? Are they profiting from that? We would go, no, they're not doing it. They're, in fact, things are getting worse for them. But the, did the church suffer? I mean, obviously, you know, the body suffers in the sense that the work of God, you know, that person is no longer there to do the work that they could do. But it's not like the church has to close its doors. It's not like, you know, the pastor just all of a sudden doesn't know what to preach anymore and, and the Holy Spirit quits talking to him because somebody got disgruntled. Okay, the only person that suffers is the person 
who is not willing to obey, the word person who is not willing to remember. And notice here at the end, this is kind of the point I want to focus in here in a minute. In verse 24, it says, Salute all them that have the rule, rule over you, and all the saints, they of Italy salute you. Now, I don't think he means literally like, you know, salute all of them. You know, I probably didn't even do it right. I wasn't in the military, but that's not what he's talking about, like a military salute. A salute is like a hail, a greeting, right? Now, I think it's beyond just your casual, you know, what were we doing when everyone came in like, what's up? <laughs> all right. I think if that's your attitude towards your pastor, like, I get when we're joking around and stuff, but like, if you were to just constantly come in and just, like, that's a... You know, that's not, a, that's not what it's talking about. It's like, hey, how are you doing, pastor? You know, hey, how you doing, brother? You know, it's a, it's a respectful greeting. You know, it's an acknowledging of them and the position that they hold, okay? Which is something we should do for everybody. I mean, that's why he says they, there at the end, they of Italy salute you. You know, it's not just for the pastor, but it needs to be there for the pastor, okay? So it's interesting here, and really this is a whole sermon we could preach, these three points. Rebe uh, remember, obey, salute. You know, those are three things we should remember when it comes to church authority. So first of all, you know, remember. Remember them which have the rule over you. That's the first, that's where it starts. You know, we need to remember that there is an authority in the local church. Don't forget that there's somebody in charge. Don't forget that the church, don't think that the church is, you know, a free-for-all. That it's like an anything goes situation. And that I could just do whatever I want and there's not going to be any consequences. I can teach whatever I want. I can get involved in whatever sin however I want. I can treat people however I want and there's not going to be any consequences. No. There is an authority that's going to hold us accountable to the things that we do, say, teach, whatever. Okay? It's not a free-for-all. It's not an anything goes situation in the church. So he says, remember that. You know, that's a good, just keep that in mind. And he goes on and says, obey. And if you would keep something in Hebrews, I'm just telling you ahead of time. We're going to come back later. But he says, obey them uh, that have the rule over you uh, and submit yourself. So, you know, it's not enough just to acknowledge, you know, remember and say, oh, yeah, there's an authority here. Well, that's great, but that's just the first step. Now we have to go to the next step, which is to actually obey that authority. And again, that authority has its limits as, as lined out in the scripture. Okay. They're not to be lords over God's heritage, but in samples to the flock, okay? So, but that authority does exist. It's still there. And, <laughs> and what that authority decides, you know, that's not up for debate. It's not up for, uh, you know, to, 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 you know, squabble about. You know, when church authority makes a decision, it's expected that it's, you know, it's, it's obeyed. You don't necessarily even have to agree with it, but you at least respect the decisions that the local church makes, okay? Yeah. And really one of the major things that this would apply in is what we were talking about over the last several Sundays, that series about get right or get out. You know, that there's certain sins that people can get kicked out of a church for. And, you know, that's one area that people need to obey church leadership in. That if church, the church leadership decides this person is worthy of, according to 1 Corinthians 5 and other passages, of being kicked out of the local church, you know, we should obey the authority by, and obey the Bible by not having fellowship with that person so that they can feel the full weight of, of, what, of the consequences of what they've done. So that they would repent and get right, okay? We would admonish them as a brother, right? And what is that admonishment? We talked about this already. It's, it's enforcing that distance that, of saying, hey, I'm not, I, sorry, I can't have fellowship with you while you're in sin. When you get right and come back, you know, and you repent, we can be friends again. That's the admonishment. It's not, oh, I feel so sorry for you. You're right, pastor, such a jerk. I can't, that's not what it's talking about. You know, just come over to my place. You know, I'll tell you what's going on. Let's get some coffee. That's not admonishing him as a brother. And I've already preached that. I'm not going to go off on it. So anyway, what I want to look at here, though, and here's the thing. If you don't obey the authority, how then is it an authority? How can you say, oh, yeah, it's an authority, but it doesn't pertain to me? Uh, but I'm above that authority. Then it's not really an authority, is it? What makes it an authority is the fact that it's obeyed, Okay. But the part I want to just kind of focus in on here, because I know there's a whole lot more else we could be talking about tonight, but is, uh, is the part where it says, salute all them that have the rule over you. And I think this is an important thing, and this is something that, you know, I've never struggled with as a lay person, as somebody who was a member of the church not in leadership, but, you know, this is something that I've struggled with, you know, having become the deacon, okay? And that's, you know, acknowledging people in, in authority properly and with respect, okay? And what I mean I struggle with that is that when I first got ordained deacon, you know, people started addressing me differently, most people. 
And at first I was like, hey, you know what? You, know, you don't have to call me that. You don't have to call me deacon or whatever. And some people insisted, but since then I've learned, you know what? No, you, you do need to. <laughs> you need to call me deacon. You need to call me brother. You know, you need to, you need to put, uh, you know, you need to put some kind of a, an, a, 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 calling me by my first name is not giving me the level of respect that I believe I deserve as the deacon. Not because of who I am, but because of the position that I've been given as a deacon, as a ruler in the church, as somebody who's speaking unto you the word of God, watching for your soul, so on and so forth. You know, and this isn't really something I struggle, I, 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 that goes on down here. I really don't worry about it. It has happened elsewhere, you know, and even outside of the context of church, you know, um, people that should know to do it don't. And I'm not, you know, trying to just get it off my chest or anything, but I think it's something that we need to, we need to keep in mind, okay? Now, th here's the thing. It's something some people, they, they do it, they don't even realize they're doing it. They just say, hey, Corbin, how's it going, right? And I give a lot of grace, and this is, you know, this is something I thought, well, should I talk about this? And then this kind of came up in the scripture. I'm like, well, now it's time to talk about it. So here's the thing. People that just call me by my first name, a lot of times they're just doing it because they don't know any better. They're not doing it out of disrespect. They're not doing it out of, they, it's not because they don't respect me. It's just that they've never been taught. They've never learned. They've never picked up on it. They, hey, you should address church leadership as deacon, Corbin, you know, uh, brother, Corbin. Or if you, if you like my last name as much as I do, Brother Russell. I mean, I don't know why that hasn't caught on. That's a cool last name, if you ask me. I don't know. <laughs> Everyone likes Corbin. Not quite as cool, okay? But Russell, I think, is pretty good. But whatever. As long as there's a brother, a deacon, something like that. You know, th th I think that needs to be there. <coughs> you know, that's what he's saying here. You know, salute all them that have the rule over you. Acknowledge them. Acknowledge, you know, remember them. Show them the respect that they're worthy of, not just, you know, this, this uh, you know, casual first name basis. I don't think that's appropriate. You know, I've never called any of my pastors by their first name. You know, even after being ordained deacon, I don't, call, I don't walk up to Pastor Anderson and say, hey, Steve, how you doing? I mean, that seems so foreign to me. Even just saying it here, you know, as, a, as a, an example, you know, I feel, I feel weird about it, you know. I always call him pastor, you know. I think that's important. Because here's the thing. Some people, they, they'll, they'll just call people by their first name kind of unknowingly just because they haven't learned and that there's no disrespect intended. I believe that. But some people, they leave off that. They'll, they'll leave it off on purpose. It's like a passive-aggressive jab where they'll just be like, hey, Steve, hey, Corbin. You know, they'll make a point of not addressing you as brother, as pastor, as deacon because they don't want to acknowledge the fact that you have a certain level of authority to some degree. So, you know, that's just something I thought I'd point out there because of the fact that it refers to Moses as a king, that he was a ruler. That if there's any body of people, uh, uh, you know, when a body uh, comes together, the people of God, they're going to do something. Somebody's got to be in charge. And there has, in order for that person to be in charge, the body has to acknowledge that person to some degree. I'm not saying you have to call me king. You, know? <laughs> you don't have to you know, put a crown on me and, and all hail, you know, long live the, the king Corbin. It's, you know... But hey, could you throw the brother on there? You know, could you throw the deacon? Even if you feel, I, deacon always seems odd to me, but I guess that's just because I've never heard it. But, you know, one of those. <coughs> now here's the thing. You know, th th what this should show us is that, you know, uh, authority is something that demands humility in the person who's leading. Because of the fact that when you're put in a position of leadership, and I'm not, and even not just a position as, you know, a deacon or a pastor, you know, everybody in this room is a leader to some degree in some area of their li in their lives. You know, well, there's fathers in here, there's mothers in here, there's older siblings in here that are an example, that are leaders. And those are all important positions. I mean, very important. And we all have to understand that as leaders, humility is absolutely necessi and necessary. Because here's the thing, if you start, maybe I start to like, you know, you, you call me deacon a little too much. You know, maybe I just start to say, you know what, uh, don't you drop the brother, it's Deacon Wrestle from here on out. And, and uh, you know, it's, you dress me as Sir Deacon Wrestles. You know, I could let that go to my head. You know, th and, and this could get me puffed up, you know. And that's why being an, an authority demands humility. And of course, why was Moses such a great leader? I mean, we'll see here in a little bit, that when Moses died, the Bible says there rose not a prophet like him in all of Israel. I mean, I, that's going to be a long line in heaven to shake that man's hand. 
I mean, that guy was a great man of God. When you're, when you're coming back on the, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration of Christ in the New Testament, and you're appearing alongside Elijah and the Lord Jesus Christ, you're somebody. I mean, you rank in heaven. All right? Now, how did he get there? Because of his humility. The Bible also says that he was the meekest man of all the men on the earth. There wasn't a meeker man than him. So that's something we have to keep in mind if we're going to be good leaders, if we're going to lead, is we have to be humble people. We can't let it go to our heads. <coughs> and the other, the kind of the last couple things I'd kind of close this thought out on is that, you know, we don't have to love leadership. You know, it's great if we do. You know, I know I do. We don't have to love them. We don't even have to really like <laughs> leadership. You know, we don't have to be their best friend, people that are in charge. Uh, you know, but here's the thing. We have to respect them. You know, not everybody had to love Moses. Not everybody had to send Moses, you know, a, a, a box of chocolates on Valentine's Day or whatever just to show how much they loved him. But they had to respect him. They had to respect the position that he had. Maybe they didn't like his personality. Maybe Moses rubbed them the wrong way. Maybe they didn't really appreciate the way he did things, but they respected the decisions that he made. And that's another thing we need to learn about leadership as well. <clears throat> and here's the thing. We'll learn to respect leadership the way we should when we understand the purpose of leadership, specifically in the local church. And you could apply this even in the home. You know, parent, you know children will have a lot more respect for their parents when they understand something. Just like you know, a church will have respect for the man of God when they understand that they're there for their own benefit. You know, they're there for their good. They're there to what? Watch for their souls. And I think you could apply that to any parent. Any parent worth their salt is going to be watching for the soul of their children. They're going to be caring about whether or not that child understands the gospel that they're saved, that they know about the things of God, that they're going to live a clean and pure and holy life as much as, as possible. That they're, you know, not that they're going to be perfect, but that they're going to be pleasing to God. That's their number one priority. We'll respect leadership more when we understand that's what they're there for. They're not there to just... You know, because they like the sound of their own voice or they like, you know, having everybody's attention or whatever. They're there because they're trying to do what the Bible says, which is to watch for their souls that they may give an account with joy. That they're there to what? Uh, to to, to uh, be a, an example to the flock. It says there to remember them considering the end of their conversation. Whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation? Considering the end of their conversation, what direction are they heading in life? What is their purpose and manner of life? Like as Timothy said, or Paul said to Timothy, thou hast both known my manner and purpose of life. You know what I'm about. You know what we're here to do. Uh, and, and that's when we'll start to uh, really respect the leadership the way we should. We understand that what they're there to do is to guide us, to lead us, and to edify the body of Christ. <clears throat> so just kind of closing thought on this, because we've got a lot more to get into, is that you know, Moses, under the inspiration, you say, well, that's pretty puffed up of Moses to sit there, you know, because again, Moses wrote this. You know, Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, referred to himself as a king. And he was king in Jeshurun. You know, he wrote that. You say, well, that's real, it's real puffed up of you to insist that people call you brother or deacon. You know, no, it's not. It's, it's just me asking for the, the, the title that, you know, the respect that I feel that I'm entitled to. You know, so I don't, I'm not a doormat that people can just walk all over. Now, I could take it. If people want to, it's, it's happened. It's going to happen again. People are just going to refer to me. They're not, they're just going to disregard me and just say, hey, Corbin, you know, and I'll be fine with it. It's no, it's no skin off my, my back. I'll be like, all right, well, now I know where you're at, you know. And again, if people do it just out of habit, you know, in disrespect, that's not a big deal either. But Moses didn't write that because he's puffed up. You know, he wrote that and he referred to himself as king. Now, why did he do that? Because, and this is something everybody that's in a leadership position or one day will be, say, well, I'm not a leader. One day you might be, though. One day you might be the, the, the supervisor. You might be the manager. You might be the pastor. You might be the deacon. You might be the dad. You might be the mom. You might be the older sibling. You know, you will be in a position of being a leader, of being an example to somebody else, of, uh, you know, being, you know, trying to care and watch over somebody else. And what we need to understand is that you need to, you need to demand that respect because of the fact that if, uh, you need to demand that. That's what I'm trying to say. You need to demand that respect from those that you're, 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 uh, you're leading. You should insist upon it. Say, hey, no, it's, it's, it's brother. It's pastor. You know, that, and nobody in this room has a struggle, but, uh, you know, it's probably more for the internet. 
you know, a real good way to not get your email read or your voicemail listened to, you know, is when you start out with, tell Steve. <laughs> and it, you say, does that happen? All the time. People want, you know, the pastor's attention. You know, they want to talk to him about something. But they can't even, they don't even have enough respect to just address him as the type, uh, with his proper title, right. pastor. Now, again, some people do it out of just habit or whatever. They don't know any better. It's not a big deal. But other times, you know, when you read that, you could just kind of hold your breath. And you're like, oh, here it comes. And sure enough, you know, next couple sentences just turn into, nye, 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 nye. you're like, yeah, well, that's what I thought. Okay. But leaders need to demand respect, you know, to be treated with respect for, by those that they're leading for, for, their, for the leader's sake and also for theirs. Okay. <coughs> but let's move on from that point. Let's go over to back to Deuteronomy chapter uh, 33. <coughs> we'll get into the specific blessing, right? Now, doesn't this blessing, uh, you know, don't you think this blessing carried more weight with these people because it was coming from Moses? Because it was coming from a leader that they respected? That a man who had authority in their life? You know, they, they didn't, the Lord didn't just pull some bum off the street and say, bless my people. I mean, well, who's this guy? You know, who cares what he thinks about us? But when they have this man that's been leading them and, and, and imploring them and dealing with them and loving on them and being patient with them and everything that's gone along with Moses leading them through the wilderness. And his, in his last words, he stands up and starts to give them a blessing. Don't you think that carried some weight with these people? It had to have. Of course it did. It says in verse 8, And of Levi he said, Let thy thummim and thy urim be with thy holy one, whom thou didst prove at Mesa, and with whom thou didst sur, uh, strive at the waters of Meribah. Those are, that's referring to the same incidents where they talked about how they brought him out of the desert to, to, to die of thirst, and he had to smite the rock, and waters came out. It's Mesa in that area of Meribah. It's talking about the, or that's probably backwards, but it's the same area. It's like a region and then a place. Anyway, he says in verse 9, Who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, neither did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they ha have observed uh, thy word and kept thy covenant. They shall teach Jacob thy judgments and Israel thy law. Of course, that was what Levi did. That was their job, was to teach the word of God, to preach the word of God unto them. They should put incense before thee and hold burnt sacrifice upon thine altar. We understand that that was their job for the Lord. And he said in verse 11, Bless, Lord, his substance, and accept the work of his hands. Smite through the loins of them that rise against him, and of them that hate them that they raise, rise not again. So again, I think this kind of gets back into this idea of respecting leadership. Because again, the Levites, they were the spiritual leaders in Israel. You know, they're the one responsible for setting up the tabernacle, breaking it down, accepting the sacrifices of the people, offering them before the altar, maintaining the house of God. I mean, they were the spiritual leaders in Israel after Moses, right? And it says there that when, when he's giving out this blessing, you know, part of it is at the end there, he says, smite through the loins of them that rise against him. I mean, he's like, it's, this is a blessing unto, unto Levites, but a curse unto those that would rise against him and of them that hate him. So he says, through, he says there, smite through their loins. And that's talking about, you know, your lap area. That's your, that's your loins, you know, from your hip to your knee. It's kind of, you know, that thigh area, your lap area. That's talking about your loins, okay? And he's saying, smite through their loins, them that rise up against them. Those that would rise up against Levi and, and challenge him or hate on him or seek to destroy him or do him harm. Let them, uh, let them be sm let smite through their loins, Lord. That's what he's praying. And that's a, you know, that's a real heavy, uh, <laughs> you know, he didn't say smack him on the wrist or, you know, beat him on. I'd rather have somebody, you know, shove a stick in my eye practically than, than be thrust through that area, right? But that's what he's, he's saying. This is a very severe punishment. And, you know, <coughs> what, you know, I want to kind of apply this spiritually here, obviously, but. When I was thinking about this, like, how can we apply this? Because we read these things and you know, we want to make application to our own life. And the thing I thought of is the fact that sometimes people, you know, they get a bad attitude towards their pastor. You know, mom or dad. And, I, you know, and I've seen this. And in the past, to be perfectly honest, before I got the faithful word, I had to check this in my own self. In fact, this is a big reason why I got out of the church I was in, because I was having a hard time respecting the pastor. And I was saying, man, I don't want to turn on these guys that's, going to, you know, get in the car after church and just start bad-mouthing the pastor in front of my kids. You know what I mean? 
And here's the thing, people do that. They get in the, they get in the car or they're at home and you know, you're just talking to your spouse and you just start bad mouthing the preacher, you're bad mouthing the leadership. You know what you're doing? You're smiting through your loins. Your kids are hearing that. You know, the ones that have come from your loins. In a spiritual sense, you're being smitten. And, there's, and, there, and then you wonder why those same kids, you know, rebel in their teenage years, why they don't show any respect for the pastor. Because there's the thing, as children, you know, they, kids learn how to play the part. They know how to, how to, how to look the part and, 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 get every, and fool everyone. And I've seen it, and they, they're inwardly, they look perfect on the outside. They got everything right, dialed in, but inwardly, they're just counting down the days. How much longer till I'm 18, I'm out of here. I've seen it, okay? <laughs> and we don't want that. That's why we ought to check ourselves, how we talk about and our attitudes towards that we, that we have towards leadership, especially in front of our children. Because here's the thing, our bitterness and our resentment towards the man of God, that could lead to our children's full-on rebellion later in life. <laughs> so that, you know, I'm just trying to make application as we go through here. I'm just thinking about these things I've seen and, and heard. And he says, uh, smite them through the loins that they rise not again. And I think this is a good point for those that are in leadership to understand, is that they, if you let the Lord do it, if you let the Lord fight your battles, they will not rise again. The Bible says the man of God must not, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle all, all men, apt to teach. Patience, apt to teach. And he's not to strive. You should let God do the smiting. He should let God take care of business. Because God, when God smites, there's no getting back from that. When God runs somebody through, that's it, they're done. They will not rise again. And that's what wise leadership will do. They'll let God deal with rebels. You know, these guys that go out, they get kicked out of these churches, and then they just spend the rest of their life making YouTube videos attacking pastors. And then, you, and then we go, well, why aren't the pastors defending themselves? Well, one, because they're complete bozos. And anybody with, with two brain cells to put together can figure out who's right and who's wrong in these situations. I mean, half their videos are just full-on, you know, half-baked af accusations with no merit. But <laughs> here's the thing. Wise leadership will just say, you know what? Go ahead. Make your videos. Get in your private chat groups. Get together with the other rebels and badmouth and spend the rest of your life doing that if that's what you want to do. I'll let God deal with it. And when God sees fit, he'll smite because when God's done with you, you're done. And I won't ever have to deal with you again. <coughs> God's much better at it than we are. <laughs> you know, that's why God said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. You know, let, leave it in the hands of the Lord. That's what wise leadership would do. Let's move on here in our, in our sermon. He says in verse 12, And of Benjamin he said, The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. Now sometimes the shorter blessings are the sweetest. I mean, you know, Levi here just got, what, like three or four verses. You know, uh, Judah got some in there. Benjamin gets just this real quick one, right? And other ones are short too, but man, out, out of all the blessings, you, you know, I, I think we could apply every one of these to ourselves, and that, you know, that'd take all night to do that. But specifically, Benjamin, you read that, and you're like, that's the one I want. The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him. I mean, that's me and you. You know, we're loved of God. You know, we're God's children. And we'll dwell in safety, in safety by Him. You know, if we're doing right, we're living right, we're walking with the Lord, we can be free from the fear of all evil. You know, the peace of God will keep our hearts and mind through Christ Jesus our Lord. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. We start getting offended, we start to get fret, we start to worry when we get started getting away from this book. The farther away we get from God and His Word, that's when the, the, the cares of this world start to creep in and choke out our hearts. But the beloved of the Lord shall dwell safely by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long. He shall dwell between his shoulders. I mean, it's a picturing of him just carrying Benjamin between his shoulders, just covering him, keeping him safe. It's a beautiful picture of God's love towards us and, and the protection that he offers us. Verse 13, he says, And of Joseph, he said, Blessed be the Lord, uh, blessed be of the Lord, excuse me, blessed of the Lord be his land for the precious things of heaven, for the dew and for the deep that coucheth beneath. Now the deep that coucheth beneath, it's talking about, I believe, what we refer to as, you know, groundwater. And say, is that really that important? Oh yeah. <laughs> That's very important. 
especially out here in a desert. You know, we're, we're, we're I think most places around here are, are pumping in water from, you know, surface lakes, other, you know, miles and miles and miles away. And everyone's always like, well, what about the sustainability of the Southwest? You can't keep going, growing out there in the water. But what they don't realize is that the city of Tempe, I've heard this, and I should probably should have fact-checked it. I'm, I'm kind of shooting off the, from the hip right now. But I was told that the city of Tempe is sitting on, one, on the biggest underground aquifers in, in the state. You know, so everyone's freaking out. And Tempe is just biding their time like, don't worry. When that water gets scarce, we got a plan. You know, and it's going to cost a little bit, but... But it just goes to show you that, you know, having groundwater is a huge blessing. There's the things that we take for granted. You know, we just go over and get a glass of water. Well, hopefully you're not doing that and get a glass of water. And you drink. I mean, Tucson might not be so bad because they don't fluoridate. But, I mean, up in where I live, it's like, is that milk? <laughs> is that skim milk coming out of my sink right now? I haven't drank it. I don't think I've had a single drop of tap water on purpose, you know. And we always go to the store, but I don't know why I'm even bringing that up. But he's saying here, look, you know, bless him, bless the, even the water that's underneath his feet. And I like verse 14. I thought this was inter interesting. He says, and for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun. And he's saying, bless his vineyards and his orchards. You know, let him have lots of citrus and bananas and, and dates and all the, you know, all the vegetables and fruits that would grow from these plants. He says, the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, right? And for the precious things put forth by the moon. And you say, well, the things that brought forth by the moon, you know, what's, what's this referring to? Well, <laughs> you know, he's saying, you know, there's the things that come from the sun and things, the precious things by the moon. You know, there's a lot of beautiful flowers that only bloom at night. You know, I looked this up. I was like, that's interesting. I looked it up. I said, I typed in like uh, plants that grow by moonlight. And there was like just 20 of these just rare plants just these beautiful flowers and things like that. And some of them not so rare that bloom at night, that grow by, by the moonlight, which is, again, just a reflection of the sun. I thought that was very interesting. And God's saying, bless that too. <coughs> so what's interesting about that is that a lot, when, I, when I was reading up about um, these plants that grow by night, by moonlight, and I was thinking, you know, there are a lot of them were just flowers. Now, our flowers are, what's the word that's going around right now? Our flowers, um, essential. <laughs> are flowers an essential plant? No, of course not. I mean, they are for pollination and things like that, right? We understand that, you know, different vegetables have, they put flowers and they pollinate, yada, yada. But, you know, there's some of them that we could probably, they could just go extinct tomorrow and everything would just carry on, right? One I thought about was the lilac. You know, I don't, who knows about, li who's ever smelled lilacs? Yeah, anyone who's kind of, do they have them down here in Arizona? I don't think I've seen them. But up in Michigan, they had these just, we had one in our front yard at my mom's house, just this huge bush, just full, it would, and it only come out for a couple weeks during the spring. And then the whole alleyway was just full of them. And man, you'd go out during a certain time of the year and, and just the fragrance that filled the air, it was just, it was great. It was beautiful. It, it smelled so much better than the corners of 48th and Southern. <laughs> you know what I mean? In Phoenix. I mean, there's some places in, in certain cities where it's like, give me a clothespin, man. I don't need to smell it. You know what I mean? So when you smell these beautiful aromas, man, that's, it's, it's just great that God's given us these things. So, I mean, what's that showing us is that, you know, God, when he blesses us, he not only does he just give us the things that we need, but he also gives us things that we would just enjoy. Things that aren't necessarily, you know, essential or necessary, but things that are just precious in the sense that, you know, they're not always around. They're just nice. It's like a privilege to get to smell that or to enjoy that. I thought that was interesting that, uh, you know, God gives us more than just what we need. You know, God could just be like, you know, crust of bread, glass of water and say thank you. Right. And, and he'd be right to do that. I mean, if God never did another thing for us. He's done more. You know, I mean, he's already that'd be fine because he's already done so much. I mean, God get, saves you. He doesn't, I mean, what, he doesn't have to do anything for you. And you're still blessed beyond measure. Well, then he kind of adds to it and says, oh, I'll give you the fruit. And how about some flowers too? <coughs> so I thought that was, that was really something. Let's go on here in verse 15. He says, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains of the precious things, of the lasting hills, and for the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof, and for the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush, 
Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph, upon the top of the head. So Joseph, I mean, you know, Benjamin got a nice one here, but God, he's really laying it on thick here with Joseph. I mean, he's like, bless this thing, give him this precious thing and this precious thing, the hills and the water and the flowers and the fruit. Just give it all to Joseph. Just bless him, bless him, bless him. Now, why is that? Well, look here at the end. He says, uh, let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. You know, he, I, I feel like he's paying him back for everything that Joseph went through. And of course, we know the story of Joseph, that Joseph was sold into slavery by his very brethren for no good reason at all, other than that they despised him and the love that his father had towards him. They despised him because he was, Joseph, uh, he was, he was favored of his father. You know, he had the coat of many colors. They threw him in the pit. They sold him into bondage. And he took it. And now, you know, his, his progenitors later not his progenitors, but his, um, his seed after him, they're being blessed on his behalf. He's saying, look, bless him with all these things the, upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. Look, the tribe of, of, you know, of Manasseh and Ephraim, they were not separated from their, brother, from their brethren. Joseph, the person was. The individual, the man, Joseph, was the only one that was separated from his brethren. <coughs> And what that shows us is that, you know, God rewards those that suffer on his behalf. And even Joseph, at the end of his life, understood that his, the suffering he went through was ordained of the Lord, that God let it happen. I'll remind us of what he said in Genesis 50, when his brethren came to him after uh, Israel had died, and they were, scared, they were afraid of what was going to happen, what, how Joseph was going to react. And he, and he calmed them, he put them at ease, and he said, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work. Or excuse me, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. If you're still in Hebrews, go to Hebrews 6. Genesis, he didn't say that. He said this. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. He's saying, look, you, you did mean it for evil. You were trying to do something bad. You know, what you did was wicked. I did suffer. I was in jail. I was falsely accused of different things. You know, I wasn't in my familiar land. I was a stranger. You know, he did suffer greatly. I mean, I can't imagine the heartache that, that Joseph went through in those early years, and, you know, throughout his whole life. He said, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. He, was, he under, was able to go through that suffering and look back and not get bitter about it, but to say, see the silver lining and see the purpose behind it. <clears throat> and, and, the la and, and what it's showing us is that God blesses those that are willing to go through that. That our latter end will be blessed if we're willing to suffer. You know, maybe we'll be separated from, from some people in our life for the cause of Christ. You know, we might lose some friends. You know, we might lose some family members. We might have people not want anything to do with us anymore. You know, and it might hurt. And they might not understand. It might be confusing to them. They might not get it. And we might suffer. Maybe, you know, we take a stand for Christ. It could cost us a job. It costs us a promotion. I mean, you know, all they that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I don't know what form it's going to come. But if you're living godly in Christ Jesus, you can mark it down that you are going to suffer persecution to some degree or another. In some, in, in some way, shape, or form, it's coming. And if we're willing to go through with it, for God's sake, he will bless us. <clears throat> Just like he did Joseph. Look in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. You know, if we, if we work and labor for the Lord, God's not going to forget that. God looked down at Joseph many, you know, his, his, uh, you know, many generations later, Moses is praying a blessing upon him for, the, for Joseph's sake. And God said, you know what, I will do it for Joseph's <laughs> sake. I will do all these things that he's asking. I will give them all these blessings. Because I'm not unrighteous to forget all the work and the labor of love that Joseph did on my behalf. Let's move on here in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, we'll get start back up in uh, verse 17. He's going on here about Joseph some more. He says, His glory is like the first thing of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. They are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. And of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. They shall call the people under the mountain, and uh, there they shall offer sacrifices of, of righteousness. They shall suck of the abundance of the seas and the treasures that are hid in the sand. And of Gad, he said, Blessed be he that enlargeth Gad. He dwelleth as a lion and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. 
He provided the first part for himself because there is no portion of the lawgiver. For he uh, was, excuse me, was he seated and he came with the heads of the people. He executed justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. Now, when you first read the one about Dan, you think, is he kind of taking a jab at Dan there and calling him a whelp? You know, he's talking about he's a lion's cub. Right now, what's more frightening, a lion or a lion's cub, a lion's whelp? We look at the lion's whelp and we go, oh, that's so, that's so cute. You know, we want to we want to take it home with us. You know, we forget that's going to grow up and be turned into a man eater. Right. <laughs> you know, the, I mean, the little baby tigers. You know, and then you then you get on YouTube and you see the, the tiger coming out of the you who saw that video, the guy chasing the two guys on the motorcycle. I mean, good night. We, we get upset because some deer jumps out in front of us. You know, we, we hit a possum or something on the way home. At least you have tigers jumping out of the woods and chasing you, you know, at 20 to 30 miles an hour, <laughs> trying to eat your flesh, right? But that's how he's not taking a jab at, at Dan. He's like, what are you talking about whelp for, you know? But yet he's saying he shall leap from Bashan, right? And Bashan, if you remember, like Og, king of Bashan, was one of the, the kings that they defeated on the other side, Jordan. So what he's saying about Dan is he's going to leap from Bashan, like a lion's whelp, you know, like leaping, like pouncing, you would think. So he's coming from the east into Canaan over Jordan, right? So what it's picturing is that, because again, you know, this, this same te terminology was used by uh, um, uh, Joseph back in um, Genesis 49, you know, or excuse me, Jacob, when he was, when he was giving out the blessings upon Israel then. And he said, Judah is a lion's whelp. From, my, uh, from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion, as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? So he's talking about the power that he was going to have you know, militarily. And he was going to be very powerful. And that's what he's saying about Dan. He's going to come out of the east into the promised land like a lion's whelp. Meaning once he gets in there, he's going to grow strong into a full, you know, full bred animal. So that's the picture there of Dan. That he's, you know, it's not, because when I first read that, I'm kind of like, man, it sounds like you're kind of calling him a, a Nancy or something, you know, like, calling him weak. No, it's the exact opposite. He's saying he's going to, he's starting out weak, you know, or small, but he's going to go and he's going to grow very big when he goes over there. In verse 23, he says, and of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, uh, satisfy with flavor and, the full, uh, and full with blessing of the Lord. Uh, possess thou the west and the south. Now, obviously, I don't have time to go through every one of these blessings, and, and you know, that would be a whole series in of itself. So I'm just kind of reading through some of these. You know, and obviously, each one of these are specific, you know, uh, literal blessings that Moses prayed upon these specific people. And we could take the time to really, you know, spiritualize these and apply them to ourselves today. We'll just touch on a few here. And he says, and, and of Asher... Let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren. So again, there's another great verse that shows you that having children is the blessing of the Lord, which is a counter-cultural statement today. You, know, you want to stand out and be unique and be different from everybody around you? Have kids. You'll stand out. You know, people will notice you at the grocery store. And it doesn't take very many, you know, I mean, I know several families that have, you know, six plus kids. And they're always, they were always telling me the stories about people making comments. And I thought, man, that's got to be kind of awkward. But I remember when I had my third, people started making comments. I'm like, man, I'm only to three. I felt unworthy. You know, I was like, I haven't even suffered enough to, to receive these, you know, all the dumb comments. Oh, you know what causes that? Why don't you get a TV? <laughs> yeah, it's like, good one, buddy. Yeah, I haven't heard that a hundred times. But here's the thing, you know, having kids is not a burden. Having kids is not a curse. You know, having kids is a blessing. That's what he prayed on Asher. He said, let Asher be blessed with 1.8 children. You know, as many as he can afford. You know, you know, let them have them enough to, you know, just replace themselves. Then he said, let them be blessed with children, meaning let them multiply. Let them be acceptable to his brethren. And let him dip his foot in oil. Thy shoes shall be bra iron and brass as thy days, so shall thou strengthen. Yeah, you need iron and brass shoes when you have that many kids, you know, because you're always, anyway. <laughs> I was trying to, that's a dumb joke. Uh, so anyway, the blessing here, what are we talking about tonight? Well, what are, we, what are we looking at here in Deuteronomy chapter 33? 
We're looking at the last words of probably one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful prophet in all the word of God, other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we just read tonight. These are Moses' last words. I'm, not, I'm, sure I'm, not, I'm sure there's other things he said to other people privately, but recorded in Scripture, this is what we have from Moses. Him pouring, you know, giving out this blessing. You know, and it's great because, you know, if we recall last week, he gave him that song, and we went into that song on Sunday when we talked about it, and that was just like a long face ripping. And he said that song would be a witness and a record against them. Remember how we talked about how he, he said, you know, the Lord is right, the Lord is just, the Lord is perfect, and you're all a bunch of wicked people, and you're all going to turn into a bunch of wicked people. I mean, the song was just this long, just scathing rebuke. But here, Moses' last words, you know, he, he, of course, they're both considered his last words, but the, the last of his last words are him pouring out this blessing, him giving these positive statements. Not him just calling them a bunch of rebels and reminding them all the bad things are going to happen. He's praying a blessing over them. He wants them to succeed. You know, God wants them to succeed. He just, he just knows the beginning from the end. He knows what's going to happen. And again, we, we went into detail on that last uh, Sunday night. <clears throat> so after he gives them that, you know, face ripping in, in uh, chapter 32, he gives out, you know, this, this more gentler, kinder, you know, uh, um, blessing here in the last chapter. You know, and this really, I think that just shows the fact that Moses, you know, he had a, a great deal of humility. You know, and he didn't, because think about it, Moses, you know, we knows what's going to happen to Moses in 34. He's going to go die. And God's already told him, you know, you, you can go look at the land, but then that's it. You're, it's time for you to go up in the mount and die like your brother and be buried. And Moses could have just, you know, ended it in verse 32 and just come out the mountain and be like, I'm there, that's all I got to say to you guys. Because remember, you know, obviously Moses sinned. But the people are kind of part, they kind of provoked Moses. You know, they were kind of partly to blame for what's going to happen to Moses. You know, when they're, when they're grumbling and moaning, complaining and being faithless yet again, and he, he's getting frustrated and he makes a mistake, you know, obviously Moses should have known better. But they, they kind of provoked him to that. And Moses, you know, he could have just come off the mount, gave him the song and been like, yeah, how do you like that? You know, and just let him go into the promised land, you know, on, on, ended on a sour note with them. But he doesn't. You know, he goes and he prays this blessing. He gives them this blessing. And I think that really shows Moses' humility. And it shows the fact that he has a real heart for God's people. You know, that he would, rather than trying to vindicate himself or kind of, you know, have the last word or whatever, he was more interested in, in them being blessed. You know, what he understood that whatever was going to happen to him was going to happen, that he couldn't change that. And rather than getting bitter about it or angry or just holding a grudge, you know, he prays this blessing and he goes out on a very positive, he gives a very, you know, uh, very positive last uh, set of statements. <coughs> and I think that shows us an important principle, One, you know, is that, you know, being, ending things on a positive note, you know, that always, that, you know, that's going to win you more flies, as the saying goes, right? You win more flies with honey than vinegar. And if you would, uh, it actually, just stay where you are. We'll, we'll wrap it up here. But I, th I just kind of want to end it with this thought. Because Moses was kind of like a father to these people. I mean, in a lot of ways. You know, he carried, like he even referred to in that sense. He said, I carried you in my bosom. You know, that he made other statements where he kind of likened himself unto like a spiritual father to these people because he was, because he was a leader. And what he's showing us here by going out on this positive note is that if you want to really make a good impression on people and, 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 ha and help them to excel and to do what they need to do, you know, positive reinforcement has its place. I mean, I'm not going to discredit negative reinforcement. There's a time and a place for that. You know, we need to have that. But sometimes I think we can't, we can't just be all one-sided. You know, this really applies most of all in the area, I think, of child rearing. You know, those that are rearing child, uh, their children according to the Bible, they understand that, you know, the, the, you know, thou shalt beat him with the rod, right? Thou shalt deliver his soul from hell. You know, he that uh, hateth his child spareth the rod. It's talking about a beating. And we're not talking about like what we think of a beating today. We're like, you know, it's beating somebody up. It's talking about a spanking, you know. Applying the rod of instruction to the seat of learning, okay? It's talking about the posterior anatomy, you know, the soft, cushiony area of the body full of nerve endings. Okay, that can, it can, you could, you know, very strongly persuade children to do the right thing using that. Right, we all understand that. But, here's the thing, we don't want to get so one-sided, that's all we're about. 
to where all we are is just, just about the negative discipline. That has to have its place. It needs to be there. And it's important. And it don't, you can't go the other direction either. Be like, well, it's just, I'm just going to be all honey and no vinegar. No, you've got to have both. <coughs> but the point I'm trying to make here is that let's not be negligent of the fact that there's a place to be for positive reinforcement. That's what Moses, I think, is showing us. By going, going passing off the scene, not being bitter and angry about what's going to happen to him, but trying to encourage the people that are about to go over, the people that he loves and cares for, to go on and succeed. And he does it by being positive. Because, you know, especially in, in, we get in this, this stripe of churches, and we love hard preaching. I love hard preaching. And we love the, the, the hard, you know, race-ripping sermons. That's great. We need that. But there's also a place for the positive sermon. Like, you say, hey, I want to preach a positive sermon. Everyone's like, <gasps> you know, oh, positive preaching. The problem is when it's positive only preaching. Okay? That's, positive preaching is not the problem. It's when it's all positive. And I mean, understand the Bible's a negative book, and there's probably more, if you, from my, my impression, there's probably more negative than positive you know, when we read about the examples of man and so forth and so forth. But that's not to say that you know, having a positive message is a bad thing. So, <coughs> you know, the blessings he's giving here, and especially, you know, the blessings so far, I mean, it's all positive. But when you read these last verses, as we're about to in a minute, you know, verses 26 on to the end, is some of the most just positive preaching you'll ever hear in the Bible. I mean, he's just giving this huge blessing, right? He says, There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon heaven in thy help. And in the excellent and in his excellently on the skies. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Is this Joel Holstein? No, it's Moses. This is a positive message. And he shall trust, uh, thrust out the enemy before thee, and shall and, and shall say, Destroy them. Israel shall dwell a safety al alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also as heaven shall drop down dew. Happy art thou. O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord? It's a very positive message he's giving here. And what we can learn from this is that, you know, there's a pl you know, negative reinforcement has its place, but so does positive. And <coughs> here, and the, I guess this is the way I want to apply this, because I'm always trying to think of ways, how can we apply this to our lives today? How can we, how, what can we do with this sermon? And, you know, when, and I think that we can apply this to parents, you know, Parents that are properly disciplining their children, you know, have and have secured the obedience of their children, they don't need to fly off the handle over every transgression. You know, every time a kid does something wrong or doesn't do things something right or is slow to, to respond, you know, we as parents don't have to immediately just go to that place of rah and just get frustrated. And a lot of times that's all it is. It's not that we, you know, we it's just it's just frustration. You know, our own personal frustration coming out. And it's not us, you know, trying to help the child, discipline them, teach them right from wrong, help them to grow, to learn to do the right thing. A lot of times, you know, they, they do something wrong or whatever, and they're not even doing it maliciously, and it's just like, Ugh! you know, you little, go get the, you're going to, it's going to be, you know, and we just get mad with them. <coughs> but here's the thing, if we've been properly training our children, and they are obedient. I mean, you know when your kids are obedient. When you can tell your children, come here, and they come. You know, and that's, that's one of the great tests, I think, early on in, with, as a parent. When a child learns to walk, and, and you know, they've, they know they can exercise their own will, they can go where they want. You want to test whether or not you have their, their obedience? Say, come here. You know? <laughs> And something you and you you teach them early on. No, when I say come here, can you, you come here? Well, why is that so important? Because when they're outside, running for the road, and I say stop, come here, don't run into traffic. I want them to listen. Okay. Anyway, I'm, what I'm saying is, once we once when we know we have the obedience of our children, when we've secured it, when it's it's there, we don't have to fly off the handle all the time over every little thing. You know, a child who has a tender heart, you know, he's going to obey. And he'll, he'll, he'll obey out of, out of, you know, in hopes of a blessing as much as they would of hopes of not getting a, a spanking. Does that make sense? <laughs> the Bible says in Proverbs 25, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. A word fitly spoken. 
You know, word, you know, we can reprove our children and correct them without, without an angry tone, without just being just furious at them over every little thing. We can simply say, say, hey, did you see what you did wrong here? Do you understand why this is wrong? And obedient children, they'll, they'll acknowledge it. And there might not even be need for physical discipline. They get it. It's there. Now, if they persist, obviously, we, more drastic measures have to be taken. But the Bible goes on and says, as an earring of gold <laughs> and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. It's Proverbs 25, verse 11. He says, an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover, somebody who knows how to reprove correctly, who knows how to say the right thing in the right tone at the right way. You know, that's like an earring of gold, an ornament of fine gold upon an obedient ear. Somebody who's already learned discipline, somebody who's already learned obedience, somebody who already has a tender heart and, and, and understands, you know, right from, you know, uh, the, the, the possibility of, of, of more negative or severe consequences for disobedience. That person doesn't need to always be just beat down verbally or whatever. We can always just express our frustrations in a, in a, in a kinder way, okay? Be more of a blessing. You know, we can, and I'll say this, we should, and can, and we should, correct our children in a calm demeanor when appropriate. You know, sometimes kids do something and, and it, they need to be corrected, but that doesn't mean we have to, you know, puff up and, and let, get our fur up and, you know, turn red and just like swell and like, ah, I'm going to come after you now. And it doesn't have to be that way. We can correct our children in a very calm demeanor. And here's the thing, if we find ourselves just always just, you know, just getting frustrated and angry with our children all the time, you know, are, we have to ask ourselves, are we really upset at them? Are we really upset at what they're doing? Or are we just taking out our frustrations on them? You know, and this is something every parent, I believe, has to deal with. I know it's something I have to deal with. You know, the kids are being noisy, they're running around, they're being kids, you know, and you want peace and quiet over. Next thing you know, you're just yelling. You know, rather than getting up and calmly taking them aside and, 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 and giving them, you know, a, a, the appropriate discipline that they need, we're just, rah, 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 just yelling from the other room. Shut up. Be quiet. Blah, blah. You know, we're, are we really mad? at? Is that the way to do it? Or are we just venting our own personal frustration? So I don't know where I was going with all that, but, you know, I just, that's what I got out of this text with Moses, you know, Coming out, you know, coming down from this mount, and what's the last thing he does? He gives them this beautiful blessing. You know, he wants them to obey. He wants them to do the right thing. He wants them to go on and succeed in the promised land, just like we want our children to succeed in life. But he does it with positive reinforcement. Now, the negative was there. I mean, go back one chapter. It was certainly there. Go read the history of the children of Israel and all the things God did to them. You know, they had learned along the way. You know, that, especially the generation that we're dealing with here in this chapter that are about to cross over, Joshua uh, and, and Younger. They saw everything that happened. They saw all the negative things. They've got, I believe, these people, they have a tender heart. And, you know, they prove it because of the fact that this generation goes over and for the most part does well. I mean, they make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. They went over. But by and large, they did a good job. I, and I know it, it, things fall apart quickly. We'll read about that later, maybe sometime with, with Joshua having to remind them, hey, choose ye this day whom you will serve. You know? So we know things weren't great forever, but I believe that Moses here is just trying to encourage these people with po you know, by giving them a positive blessing, by saying, hey, it doesn't have to be all, you know, just, it can be, there can be some sweetness and light here. It doesn't have to be all just anger and frustration and you're going to get it and you better straighten up or you, you, you know this negative reinforcement he also tries to give some of this positive and that's what he ends here saying in verse 29 happy art thou O Israel who is like unto thee O people saved by the Lord you know what a privilege to be God's people the shield of thy help and who is the sword of thy excellency and thine enemy shall be found liars unto thee and thou shalt tread upon their high places. And he's, this is a positive sermon that he's giving here at the end. And he's reminding them of the privilege that they have of being God's people. The, 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 the surety they have of victory through the Lord. You know, we have that today. You know, spiritually, we're not going to do this physically. We're not going to go conquer some land. But spiritually, you know what? One day our, the, our enemies shall be found liars unto us. 
every railing accusation, every, you know, the accuser of our brethren that stands before the throne day and night, you know, accusing our brethren falsely, the devil, you know, one day he's going to be brought before the throne before our feet and be found a liar. We shall judge angels, the Bible says. <coughs> Thou shalt tread upon their high places. And that's the, you know, the people that are experienced that are the people that are God's people. They're the ones that have that privilege. That's what Moses is reminding him here before he sends him off. His last words are, don't forget who you are. Don't forget the privilege that you have of being God's people. And that's the way we should feel too. We should read that and we can apply all this to us. Happy are we who is like unto us. We are the peculiar people. We are uh, you know, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. We are a people saved by the Lord. God is our shield. He is our help. He is the sword of our excellency. And our enemy should be found liars. You know, it's a real privilege to be God's people. That's what Moses wanted to remind us uh, of these people. And that's what I want to remind us of tonight before we go. Let's go ahead and pray.